Good morning. What a wonderful day to be together. It's a very exciting day today. It's, by the way, it's the last day or the last Sunday for us in this month. And uh, where is the January gone? It seems to have come and gone very quickly. Uh, coming up, and we're not going to do announcements right at the moment, but we've got a very full and exciting month of February coming up. Um, so stay tuned, and I will just mention right at the moment, next Sunday morning, we're having a very special Sunday where I want us as a church family to um, invite our friends and family along and hopefully get them along here for next Sunday. But I'm glad you're here today because today I believe that God has given us or given me a the message that I believe will resonate with every single one of us, but something that we all struggle with. And the reality is that uh, we mess up at times. We all mess up. We, we, we don't do what we know we should. We do the things that, well, we think we do the right things and often they turn out bad and they just get messed up. And one of the most often asked questions that I have where as, a, as a pastor is, how can I know God's will? Can you tell me or can you ask the Lord to show me his will for my life? And over the past few weeks, this, this month of January in this series called Starting Point, we've been talking about how we can remain faithful to God, how we can put his plan into action in our life and living in a world that is very anti-God or even anti-Christian in many regards. And if you're like me, it's likely that there have been many times in your life that where you feel, you know, I've just messed up and I've um, perhaps you feel that you've messed up so much that there isn't even any hope of trying anymore. Well, there is a reason to try. And today I, I pray that would be an opportunity for us to come back. And uh, today, maybe you've started out okay in your walk with the Lord, but things came up, distractions took over and busyness of life takes over. And especially in the beginning of the year when everything's starting up, school's going back and businesses are restarting, it's easy to allow busyness of life to take our focus off God and off his plan and to, to focus on what's the most important at that moment and sometimes that isn't God. And so God's plan seems to get lost in the, in the ministry or in the mixture of all those things that happen in life and the reality is most of us don't know or question perhaps what is God's plan for me anyway? And the, and the reality of that is, is that 95% of God's will or God's plan for our life is found within the passages of this book, the scriptures. 95% of God's plan for your life is found in here. God's general plan in scriptures tell us who he is. It gives us a little of his character, his power, his authority, he, how he made us, how he wants us to live, the things he wants us to, to do, how the things that we do meet with his approval or the things that don't meet with his approval. It gives us clear instructions on the, the blessings that will happen when we do the things that he asks us to do, it gives us clear consequences of things that will happen when we don't do the things that we're supposed to do. It tells us how we can be absolutely sure that we will be able to be in the kingdom of heaven by doing what he asks us. He gives us, it tells us that he gives us a helper. We don't have to do this on our own but we have a helper that will help us through every single moment and everything that needs to happen or we need to do as a result of that is found within the pages of his word. 95% of everything that we need to do is here. This book is filled with examples of people's successes and their failures, which I think is rather amazing. And how when those who failed were forgiven for the things that they'd done and when they 
when they turned back to him, when they went through the right process of coming back to him, how others, though, refused to turn back to him and were stuck. They chose to live their own life, even though they knew what they ought to do, they chose not to, the consequences of that. This book gives us 95% of what we need to know in order to live life's, God's plan for our life. So if you're wondering what you need to do to be in God's will, to know his plan for your life, read and study the word of God. The other 5% is discovered by discernment. It happens when we are doing the 95% we're, supposed, we're told to do. When we are keeping to what God wants us to do, he begins to reveal to us the specific plans that he has for us so that we can do what he wants us to do. But it's unlikely he's going to be very specific if we're not adhering to the 95% that he's already given us. So the more individual tasks and the purposes that God has in store for us are a result of us being sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit as we diligently follow what is laid out for us in the Word of God. So if we want to know God's specific plan for us, it begins by understanding what His general plan is for us in the Word. And quite honestly, if we're not prepared to do what he wants generally, he wouldn't give us anything to do specifically, I don't believe. Well, he may, but there'll be, it'll be a lot more struggles involved in the process. The, God, the chance of God trusting us with an individual plan will be very limited. In fact, James 4, uh, one of the first verses that I, I shared in this this church, when we came 15 years ago, Karen and I came 15 years ago, I think James 4.17 was one of the first verses that we actually memorised as a church right at the very outset. And it says, to him who knows the good they ought to do and they don't do it, that's sin. When we know what we should do and we refuse to do it or don't do it, we're actually doing something wrong. But what happens when we do that? What happens when we mess up? What happens when we, we sin? Maybe we have given our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ and maybe we even understand what his plan is for our life. But we've been too scared to step out in faith or there's a fear that's there and we know what we should do but it just seems such a big daunting thing for us to, to do what we know we should do. Everything else seems to add up against it. Maybe we know what we should be doing, but we just don't want to do it because we're enjoying what we're doing now. Maybe if we know what we're supposed to do, that's going to, and, and God wants us to do that, maybe that's going to inhibit what I want to do. Maybe. You do know how you should live in this broken world, but it's just too hard. It's just too frustrating. It's just too difficult because, Ron, you don't even know half the things that are going on in my life. It's really hard to keep to doing what God wants me to do. And my prayer for you today is that each of us, <clears throat> excuse me, each of us might be willing to humble ourselves and acknowledge our need and come back to him. For he is far more willing to forgive us than we are to ask for forgiveness. He's far more ready to forgive us and restore us than we are to actually have the courage to step out and make that step. <clears throat> Pride, it keeps us from asking and pride comes not from God, but from Satan, dev the devil himself. Pride hinders the things that we do because we don't want to because of what might happen. Satan does not want you or I to try and seek God. He doesn't want you to be restored. And, and so 
what happens is that he works hard at making sure that you remain prideful, that we remain stubborn. And so when the challenge comes to be restored, oh, I don't know, other people might look at me or other people might say something or what will, what will happen? Does that mean? And suddenly this pride stuff sticks up and it prevents us from doing what we know we ought to do even, even then. And so today I want to conclude our starting point series. The idea of starting point is where do we start off from this year? By going back to the Old Testament today and to a book that many are familiar with. If you're not, that's fine. We're going to be talking about it. So it's the story of Jonah. And if ever there was a man who knew the will of God and didn't want to do it, it would be him. A man who knew exactly what he should do, but didn't want to do it. He refused to do it. And so if we want to know what happens when we choose to go our own way, all we need to do is look at this book of Jonah. And we're not going to read the whole book, but we'll be reading certainly a good portion of chapter 1 and 2. And so if you've got your word of God with you, you can turn to Jonah chapter 1. It will be on the screen. If you're watching at home, it will be on the bottom of your screens and it says in Jonah 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. For the wickedness has come up before me, says the Lord. But Jonah arose and fled to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and he went down onto it and to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and lain down and was fast asleep. How do you even do that? So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? I've said that to my children at times when they should have got to school. Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we might know who, for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Okay, Jonah in short terms knew he had to go to Nineveh, decided that he didn't want to go to Nineveh, headed off to Tarshish, the storm came up and now he's been found out. So this record of Jonah helps us to understand what happens when we stand or go against what God wants us to do. And the first thing that I want us to notice is that when, when we step away from doing what God wants us to do, the devil always provides a boat for us to flee on. He always provides an alternative. Jonah knew what the word of God was for him. He knew that he was supposed to go to Nineveh. He knew he was supposed to tell them about God. But the reality is that he didn't want to. And he didn't want to because these people in Nineveh, well, in his mind, they deserved to go to hell. They were horrible people. The Ninevites were often at war with the Israelites. They were Assyrians and they were an idolatrous, proud, ruthless nation bent on world conquest and they wanted to get rid of every other nationality other than themselves. They were not nice people to be around, Gentile as opposed to Jew. And, and Jonah just didn't think they deserved anything. And I can relate to Jonah and probably you can. There are people in my life and probably in yours that, you know what, they deserve to go to hell after what they've done. But then I quickly come back in my own thinking and think, you know what, I deserve to go to hell for what I've done in my life as well. But God has been gracious. The devil always provides for us a boat. Jonah didn't want to see God's mercies extended to these Assyrians. 
And he knew that in his heart, he knew in his heart that God, God's intention was to show mercy. So instead of being obedient to the call to go to Nineveh, he jumps on a ship that would take him to the most remote part. In fact, real, the reality is it, Jonah didn't even need to get on a ship to go to Nineveh. He goes down to Joppa, gets on a ship and he travels 3,000 miles, I think it is, as opposed to going 500 the other direction. He runs away from where he knows he's supposed to be. And Jonah's thinking, whatever happens to Nineveh, I'm just not going to be there to see it. God's wrath can come upon it. He can burn them all up because they don't deserve any mercy. Was it just a coincidence that there was a ship ready to sail in the opposite direction? Maybe, maybe not, but it doesn't matter. But what that ship did was to provide an alternative. It gave him the option to doing what God's will for him was. And while we're, there was nothing wrong with the ship itself, the ship was just doing what ships do. They were taking cargo. They were doing everything right. But the reality is that whenever we sense a call of God to do something, when, uh, to re be restored, come back to him, or to do some other form of ministry, whenever we sense the call of God on our life, the devil always always, always provides an alternative for us. It may be a job offer. It may be a wage rise. It could be an opportunity for an easier lifestyle. It could be just increasing our busyness. It could be that perhaps we feel our family is too young at the moment to do what we know we should do, or, or maybe our family's too old. Perhaps it's a distraction of some kind that comes up and we know what we're supposed to be doing, but you know what? Life is just difficult at the moment. <clears throat> Satan will always provide an alternative to the call of God when God calls us out so that we're unable to fulfill the ministry that he's called us to do, to fulfill the calling that he has placed upon our lives. And we, I am, I'm sure we're all guilty of doing that at some point in our life. And we need to recognise that when it happens, that Satan will always provide an alternative, <clears throat> a way out. Secondly, when we rebel against God, problems are always the result. Verse 4 tells us the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. And Jonah's disobedience brought with it not only problems for himself, but it also threatened the lives of those on board. Now, no one was, was drowned or, or anything even hurt in this process, but that's not always the case. While they didn't lose their lives, they lost the cargo. They lost any profit that the trip was going to bring for them. And they feared for their lives. The ship itself, it tells us, was at risk of breaking up. And while when we disobey God, when we turn away from what we know God wants us to do, it, the, the results are problems will arise. Problems always happen when we run away from God. Innocent people, including those that we love and care about, can get hurt <clears throat> when we don't want to do what God wants us to do. Maybe it's a spouse Maybe it's kids, grandkids, or, or our friends, but sometimes it's people that we don't even know will wear the brunt or the consequences of our disobedience. There are always consequences. When we choose to do away with God's will in our life, there are going to be consequences. When we run from him, our life will always start a downward trajectory a downward spiral. Our disobedience will likely in some ways cost us, in, whether it's financially or physically or relationally, it will affect us. And we must recognise though that even in the consequences that are happening in our life, that God allows opposition to come into our life to encourage us to make better decisions. And most of us are here this morning because God intervened. 
It's when we're at the bottom of our life cycle in that sense where we've reached rock bottom that God seems to intervene and says, you know what, you need to get right with me. He allows those things to happen so that we would come back to him and make better decisions. Thirdly, when we rebel against God, we always try to ignore the fact that we're wrong. It's everyone else's fault. The storm is battering the ship. The sailors are throwing their cargo overboard and Jonah is asleep. And the marinas were afraid. And so the captain came to him in verse 6 and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Ah, rise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we might not perish. How did he fall asleep in the bottom of a boat that was in that state? My mind jumps to Jesus doing exactly the same thing on the Lake of Galilee. But that was a whole different scenario. Here Jonah's at fault, but he seems to be asleep. What happens when we rebel against God is that our first response is to deny it or ignore it, hoping it will go away thinking that we can just move on. Things happen, you think, oh, that's just life and that's the way it is. The problem with that is that there is nowhere in Scripture we are given the indication of that ignoring the will of God is okay. Nowhere does it say that's all right. Jonah went to sleep in the midst of the turmoil and and wonder how he did it. But the truth is that while we might not be sleeping physically in our world, by continuing on in our life like nothing is wrong, when we know that things are not right with us and God, when we continue to do what we know to be wrong and we clearly disobeyed what God wants us to do, it's no different to falling asleep in the bottom of a ship. We're asleep. How And we ask ourselves, how can I be so blind? How can I be so asleep and not see all this stuff that's happened? But we do. We hide away from what we know we ought to do, believing that what we're doing is not such a big deal, whether it's, you know, we, the language that comes out of our mouth. And even though we know in Ephesians it says, let no corrupt word proceed from your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification We're told that our language should be edifying so that it might impart grace. Or it could be even in the type of company that we keep. And we know that Corinthians again tells us that we shouldn't be deceived because if we're keeping the wrong company, evil company corrupts good character. So we know we should be keeping the right kind of company, but you know what? There's so much attraction to the wrong kind of people. Or even in the relationships that we seek after. 2 Corinthians again tells us that we shouldn't be unequally yoked with one another with unbelievers. What fellowship has righteousness and lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness? The the relationships that we have, we we need to be careful that we're not intimately and, and closely keeping those relationships because we want to. There's a host of other secret things that we do that are mentioned in Scripture that we're, we're kind of aware of, but we don't want to do that. Even though we know Jesus would not approve if he was sitting right beside us. And while that may be what it takes or what takes place when we rebel against God, the good news is that God does not leave us in that state. There is good news to this whole story of Jonah. Because God always, always provides a way back. Even when we rebel and turn away from him, there is no depth from which we can go that God cannot bring us back from. He will always bring us back or lead us back, provide a way back. We might give up on our life, but God never gives up on us. He has provided a way back for full restitution so that we can be assured that we can be in the kingdom of heaven. 
Despite our disobedience in the past, God always provides a way that we can be restored. God's love for us has never waned. It's never shifted. It's what John 3, 16 talks about. For God loved the world so much, it wasn't just people who loved him who he loved. He loved the entire world so much that he sent his son. And Romans 5, 8 tells us that God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for all of us, all of us he died for, not just for those who would, would want him. And our response ought to be that when we realise that God has not been so close, that we've, been dis, we've distanced ourselves from where God wants us to be, would that we would have a desire to be restoring this relationship that has been broken. And the first step to doing that restoration is that we need to choose to go to the right person. After Jonah confessed to the sailors that he was the one at fault, what they did, uh, they threw him overboard. And you know what, what's, what's amazing with that? Is that when they threw him overboard, the, calm, the sea came, became calm, everything went back to its normal stuff and the, the sailors, the mariners on the ship, their response to seeing that happened, they praised God, the God Almighty. They witnessed a miracle and they attributed it to not their gods anymore, but to the God of, that Jonah was supposed to be answering to. And, they, and he said, throw me overboard and it'll stop. And it did. That took a bit of courage. But I'm, I'm figuring at this point, Jonah just wants to die. He doesn't really mind about what's going to happen. It's while he's sinking to the bottom of the ocean that he, the water, whether it got into his ears and got to his brain or something, he came to his senses. And in Jonah 2, we read this, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. I remembered the Lord and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And when we have been confronted by our rebelliousness, our first response ought to be that we seek him. We turn and confess our errors to him. Become vulnerable. Be, do away with the pride aspect to, to actually come and not worry about what everyone else is doing because this is important that God is calling us as individuals. That's the first indication of a humble heart. Pride is the opposite to humility. And God calls us that we need to have a humble heart. A rebellious heart, heart will typically blame others. It's not my fault. I don't care. It's my life. I can do what I like with it. We blame everyone or anything. A, a rebellious spirit will try and justify bad behaviour by making out that things are not that bad anyway. Everyone else is doing it, so why does it matter? Or... Others are doing worse than I'm doing. I'm not as bad as so-and-so down the street. Pride does that. Rebelliousness does that. And we pray and ask uh, when we turn to him, when we choose to go to him, the right person, he will begin or he will continue to do the work that he's already begun in you. He's working in you even before you realise he's working in you. His grace is at work. Our second response to knowing what we should be doing when God, when we mess up and we've rebelled against God is we need to choose to release the things that hold us back. Jonah goes on in Jonah 2, he says, those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. And as you read through that, you realise what's actually taking place in Jonah's heart. He sought the Lord and he realises that he's put things in his life, idols, that are not really what they're supposed to be. And he's releasing them. He's saying, Lord, you take care of these things. You do deal with it. When we believe lies and when we're worshipping any kind of idol or, or pursuing pleasures of this world or or that not so that we pursue those things over and above or over the will of God, we forsake or turn away from his mercy and grace. We ignore it. 
So our response ought to be to choose to turn to Jesus. And when we turn to Jesus, we confess, acknowledge and repent and turn away from those things that have held us away from him. That's not always easy to do that. Sometimes they're things that we really don't want to let go, but they're things that are hindering us returning to him. They're preventing us from having an intimate relationship with him. And our idols can be anything, really, honestly. It's not about having, having a carved image in front of us. An idol can be anything from the love of money to the love of sport to the love of work or to the love of family or to the love of anything and having more to things than anyone else, to things like lust and drunkenness and selfishness and partying and anything that we do in our life that puts, we put in front of loving God. When we put anything in front of God, that is the thing that we will honour and worship. And it's anything. Our idols are, are key to this. And we need to choose to release those things and say, Lord, no, Lord, those things I'm going to trust you with now. My job, it's yours. My finances, they're yours. I don't understand where I'm going to get enough to live on. I don't know where I'm going to live. I don't know what's going to happen. But I do trust that you know what's best for me. It's releasing the things that are holding us back. They're the things that what the world focuses on, but they're not the things that we should be focusing on. They're things that are holding us back from living our lives in a way that's fully surrendering to him. And if we don't, we're probably finding ourselves rejecting the very mercy that God has offered us and making the choice to pay the price of our own disobedience in the process of that. Thirdly, or number six, but third thing that we need to do when we want to come back to him is choose to do what God wants us to do. Verse 9 of chapter 2, Jonah chapter 2 says, but I will sacrifice to you. Here he is, I'm saying, I'm going to give it to you, sacrifice to you. With a voice of thanksgiving, I'm going to pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. In other words, he says, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do. I'll pay what I vowed to do. I, he, this is a prophet of God who's vowed to, to take the word of God to the people so that they might repent. And he's disobeyed that. He's not done what God's called him to do. He's run off to Tarshish, left the Ninevites to do what they want to do, not cared about them. And here he is, he says, you know what? Here I am, a living sacrifice. I'm giving up. I'm going to pay what I vowed to do. In other words, I'll, I'll go because salvation is of you. It's not of me. He makes this vow to the Lord saying that I, I'm making this in a sincere vow right now, which as soon as my circumstances will permit, I will faithfully execute what you've called me to do. I'll pay that which I've vowed. I'll follow through on the vow that I've made. And you know what happens? Well, you do, many, many of you do. This fish spits him up on the ground under the beach. When we speak of sacrifice, it's, it's often giving up something that we value or treasure. We don't really sacrifice something we don't care for. That's good riddance. A sacrifice is, is something that we actually do care about and care for and what we're called to do is that we need to make sure that we give those things to the Lord to take care of and trust him with it. It can be giving up of something that's hard to give up, and it usually is. And in the process of that, to give the Lord thanks in the midst of our circumstances that he's brought us to, me, to, brought us to this point where we need to be confronted on these things. Maybe our life has been on this downward trajectory, but he's brought us to a point where we can be restored to give him the thanks in the midst of our circumstances. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, he tells us in everything we should be giving thanks. 
for that's the will of God. In everything, give thanks. Do you realise, I mean, I'm sure you do, how hard that is? When the, you think of the worst situation that you've been on and say, thank you, Lord, for that, while you're in the middle of it. It's easier, not easy, but easier to look back on it and say, you know what, I do thank the Lord for that. Even though it was hard, I see what's come out of that. But when I'm in the middle of those times, I don't really think that that's something to be thankful for. But we're told we should because God has allowed that to happen for whatever reason that we might be restored most most likely. And if we continue to run away and continue to do our own thing, worse things are going to get, or the worse things are going to get. The longer that we run from God, the worse the storm will get. Do you imagine what would have happened if Jonah had not done anything, if for some reason he'd stayed asleep or he'd not confessed or anything like that? What would have happened? It's likely lives would have been lost ultimately. And the longer we run from God, the worse things get. It will only get better when we choose to do what God wants us to do. It will get better. It won't be easy. We still have problems. And sometimes they're significantly, incredibly difficult problems to work through. But because our joy is in the Lord, they don't seem to consume us anymore because we know that he's going to take care of my problems. The scriptures actually said he will take care of them. He'll deal with them. Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. And we can, if we can come to the point where we can say, you know what, Lord, they deserve or that I deserve all of this. He says, you know what, I, let me deal with it. I know what they deserve. We don't dictate how we need to, or we do dictate how we respond, but we, we shouldn't be dictating how God should respond. And I pray that because our joy is in the Lord, that we won't allow all these difficulties to consume us, that they won't, they, the, the problems won't dictate how we live. This world is mixed up and broken. There's no question about that. It's anti-Christ, it's anti-Christian. The world will object to the word of God because it's the word of God. It's just that simple because they're being, we're being as a world told what to do and no one likes to be told what to do. Unless, of course, we submit to him, which is the right course of action our world won't listen and obey because that would mean that it would have to change its whole, oh, and in fact, everything would change. The education system would change. The way that science is, is evaluated would change. Lifestyles would change. It's just too big of a deal. So they won't change. In fact, what I think is happening is that they know what they're doing is wrong, but they're justifying their bad behaviour because to make the change is just too hard pretty much what we all have to come to. And the things of this world won't last though. That's the, the other news, that what you see is temporary. The scriptures tell us that this is not a permanent resonant for, residence for us. The world and the desires and everything that it causes, the problems and all of those things, they're going to disappear. They're going to be dealt with. The world is passing away, says John in John, 1 John 2. The world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. He who does the will of God abides forever. We need to return to him. We need to recognise that we've messed up. All of us have messed up. And the only thing that we have to do now is to receive him, is to submit to him, is to confess and repent, turn back to him, choose to go to the right person, that we need to make sure that we release the things that hold us back and we then choose to do what God wants us to do, be obedient in that process. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 is one of those favourite verses that keeps coming up and one that many of us have memorised, even my granddaughter has memorised this, but trust in the Lord 
with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Put him first. He will direct your path. It won't always be what you want. It won't always be easy, but he sends him us a helper to get us through. He draws us into, that's what the body of Christ is all about. The church is ought to be. The churches are a place where fellowship can happen, where we can uphold one another, sustain one another, rest in the peace of knowing that we have people that that are like-minded that will help us. We will have to make difficult choices, but when we mess up in this world, we will do that, by the way. We will mess up. The quicker we decide to turn back and confess and obedient, the quicker our life will get back on track. Ignoring him, which we're prone to do, will only prolong it. Choosing to go with God is really the only choice that makes any kind of sense. So I want us to consider that today. And I'm confident that there are some, whether you're listening at home or you're in the, in the service here today, right at this moment in time, there are some who recognise this prideful spirit, this, this thing that's holding you in your seats when you, need, you know you need prayer. You know you need to return to him. You know what needs to happen, but... Pride steps in. You know that at home you you should be doing something, getting back onto your knees, put asking for prayer online because that's what we have people online doing that right at this moment in time. And I pray today that we won't, we'll put aside that attitude. It doesn't matter what other people think, really, it doesn't. What matters more than anything is what God thinks. And I would confidently tell you that there is probably not one person who has made that decision in the past who did not feel a little apprehension of stepping forward the first time. Every one of us feels like that. So this is not something that's unique or or different to you. And it's Satan's way of keeping us from making the best decision of our life. So I'm going to, I want to pray now, but I'm going to stand over here this morning and just ask you, if you need prayer, if you need prayer for anything, not just what we've talked about, but you need prayer this morning, come and pray with me. I'm happy to do that. Well, we've got it. We're going to have a song to sing in a minute, but you come and you ask for prayer. And I pray that, that you will, for those that need to put aside the things of rebelliousness and pride and those things that we've hung on to, that you wouldn't be ashamed to come forward, that you wouldn't be afraid to step up because I know the joy that comes when we confess and repent and receive Jesus into our life. It is the most exciting place to ever be. And we would rejoice with you. Let me pray for you before we go into this song. But Father, I thank you for your grace and mercy, for your love, your protection, your care and attention to us. You never forget us. You never leave us. You're always watching over us. You know the things that have happened in our life, the good things and the bad things. Father, I'm sure that there are times when when you have shed a tear for the things that have happened to us. But, Lord, you've never forgotten us and you tell us that vengeance is yours, that you will repay according to what is necessary. And while, Father, we focus on the negative stuff, our mind cannot be focused on what is good and pure and true and noble and excellent and praiseworthy. While our our head is consumed with things that are pulled us down and all the problems, our head cannot be focused on them and have, we can't have the mind of Christ. But you tell us, Lord, that we should come before you, confess and repent, that we would be a living sacrifice, ready to serve and worship you, that your desire is that we would have our minds renewed, our, uh, retransform the way that we think 
to help us to overcome the, the negativity and the pride and, and all of those things that Satan holds us in bondage to so that we might be restored fully because, Lord, you wait for us and you tell us in the Scriptures that there is more celebration in heaven over one lost sinner than pretty much anything else. Father, we want to rejoice today because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of your glory. All of us deserve hell and destruction. But you have provided a way of escape. You have given us a free gift, the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. We turn back to you. We ask, we confess now in our heart the things that we know how we've wronged you. Bring them to mind, Father, so that we might confess them and we would repent, turn our way back to you. We would ignore the things that are wrong and commit to the things that are right, that we might be restored fully into your presence and to receive the joy of the Lord, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that you would guide us and protect us. Your word tells us you would give us the things that we need, the gifts that we would need to, to serve you, to honour you and to obey you. You would surround us, Father, with the right kind of people that we might have love and, and people that would take care of the things that we need. And, and we're not alone in this, Father. For those who are lonely, we pray, Father, that today there would be a filling into their spirit of, of your presence and your purpose that they're serving you would, would be a, an outlet and a means to be able to be restored fully, to know that, that we do have a purpose and you do have a plan for us. And your desire is that we know it, Lord, you've given us it in written form. 95% of it is there. Help us to be fully obedient to you so that we might know what your good will is, your good, pleasing and perfect will is. So, Lord, I pray. For those who will be in this, this building here at this moment, those who are listening online, those who will listen into sometime into the future, I pray that you would speak deeply into our spirit right now and restore us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.